Welcome to Parasitic Diseases. Today we'll be discussing paragonomiasis, an infection caused by Paragonomus westermani and its relatives. There are many species of Paragonomus, uh, also known as the lung fluke, found throughout the world. And in depending on the place that we find ourselves, uh, the species will vary. So, uh, for instance, if we're in Africa, particularly in West Africa, so we would find Paragonimus africanus. However, if we were to locate to uh, Southeast Asia, the dominant species there is Paragonimus westermani. And in the, the New World, as it's called, Paragonimus calicati is the dominant species. But keep in mind that there are many, many different species of Paragonimus that could be included into this list. There are perhaps 40 different uh, species of Paragonimus that have similar life cycles that are transmitted from an uh, invertebrate host to us through the ingestion of raw or undercooked crustaceans. The history of discovery of this parasite involves two players, uh, Kerbert and the ever-popular Sir Patrick Manson. Kerbert was the first person to actually see the adult of this parasite in a patient who had perhaps died from some other reason, like tuberculosis, for instance. Um, the parasite adult was found uh, embedded in lung tissue and is quite large, perhaps a uh, centimeter and a half to two centimeters in length. Whereas Patrick Manson concentrated his efforts on describing the clinical features of paragonomyosis. The life cycle is a typical uh, trematode life cycle involving an invertebrate, intermediate host, namely the snail, and a crustacean in this case as the, um, the object onto which the metasicaria insists. So we begin our infection as typical of all the others by saying how we catch the infection. And we catch the infection by eating raw or undercooked crustaceans, in this case, an undercooked crab. We bite the leg or the carapace or the claw of the crab to get at the meat inside. And in doing so, the metasicaria on the outside of the, the crab itself is loosened and becomes part of our meal. <clears throat> it seems like an unlikely consequence, but nonetheless, this is a, a dominant infection in some parts of the world. The metasicaria is then, uh, along with the crab meat, of course, uh, travels down the alimentary canal until it gets into the stomach. The uh, acellular protective coating on the metasicaria is digested away, releasing the immature larva, which develops to an adult <clears throat> rather quickly as it actually penetrates the wall of the small intestine, migrates through the diaphragmatic tissue, and enters the pleural cavity, at which point it encounters lung tissue, and it migrates into the lung tissue itself. A remarkable way of um, actually traversing a very complex host, much the same way as uh, fasciola uh, exited the small intestine to then migrate in the, plural, in the peritoneal cavity until it found the liver. Once the adult is present in the lung, it begins to feed on lung tissue and create for itself an abscess. Now, Paragonimus has the capacity for self-fertilization, but typically they're found in pairs. And so each adult worm sort of reverses itself on the other and the sperm passes from one, organi one organism to the other, and therefore you get cross-fertilization rather than self-fertilization, which is the rule. The eggs then are produced as a result of mating, and eventually they, are star they begin to be passed by the, adult by the adult worms. They're both adult females and males. And the eggs then exit via the respiratory tree across the epiglottis, we could either expectorate them into the environment, or they can be swallowed and eventually will exit via the stool. They must be deposited in fresh water in order for this cycle to continue. The egg then uh, hatches. The myricidium 
seeks out a snail host. Sounds just like the others that we've talked about before. Uh, various stages of the infection occur within the snail, which um, allows the organism to replicate and to develop uh, uh, multiple uh, numbers of the carrial stage, which then leaves the host, uh, intermediate host, and seeks out one of these crustaceans. And there obviously must be environmental cues which uh, allows it to detect these in their environment because they don't insist on anything else except crustaceans. By ingesting this crustacean uncooked or lightly brined, where the uh, inner portion of the metasicaria is unaffected, that's how we uh, complete the life cycle. You'll notice I've indicated several reservoir hosts. Uh, one is uh, the domestic pig. The other is a, a tiger. <clears throat> Tigers turn out to be the only cats besides jaguars that actually like water. And uh, tigers are omnivorous. They will eat whatever is alive in front of them that they can capture. And in uh, many situations, uh, they will eat, uncooked, of course, uh, crustaceans that they uh, can scavenge for in various aquatic situations. The discovery of uh, Paragonimus calicati was actually discovered an autopsy of a Bengal tiger, which was kept at a zoo in um, the, mid, the American Midwest. So that's how we even knew about the species to begin with. Shown here are all the life stages of the parasite, starting with the egg, the myricidium, the snail hosts that are typically infected by Paragonimus species, the Sicaria. <coughs> the Sicaria then insists, in this case, as the crayfish, you can see the metasicaria shown here, and then the adult worm that uh, Kleber or Kribert uh, discovered is shown here. So what happens to a person who's infected with Paragonimus? Well, with one or two pairs of worms in the lung tissue, um, certainly there is signs and symptoms of the infection. One of the signs, of course, is finding blood in your sputum. And as a result, you you're suspect that something's wrong. That is not a normal thing to see in, in sputum. It would, in most cases, uh, cause someone to seek um, medical advice and medical help to, to diagnose what the cause of it is. And in some cases, the physician would likely be drawn to a diagnosis of tuberculosis. Cavitary tuberculosis would be a typical disease that might result in hemoptysis. But in this case, there the Radiogram does not show a typical tuberculosis-like uh, involvement. And now Dr. Daniel Griffin is going to give a clinical vignette illustrating the pathogenesis of this infection. This is a 39-year-old fisherman who is living in rural Thailand with his family, coming in with a report of seven months of cough. Now, he reports that he has hemoptysis. Now, he probably doesn't use that word. One, he's speaking Thai, and that's a technical word for the coughing up of blood. But he does report that in addition to the coughing up of blood, he otherwise feels well, uh, but he's concerned because he keeps coughing up blood. This is continuing. Now, he reports that he really enjoys salted crab somtam. Uh, he tells us that he works as a fisherman and he lives with his uh, family. The patient does not have a fever. He looks well. But a chest x-ray is, is done, and this reveals an abnormal area with increased opacification. So it looks like there's something going on in the lung. Let's talk a little bit about clinical disease. Now, early infection occurs between the time of ingestion of the infected, um, infective metasarcaria and lasts up until the flukes mature into egg-producing adults, right? So this is our acute early infection. During this stage, now some patients may be asymptomatic, but others can actually present with a number of symptoms, including diarrhea, fever, chest pain, fatigue, um, urticaria, uh, epigastric pain, eosinophilia. Uh, patients may actually go on to develop a cough with blood tinged sputum, trouble breathing or dyspnea, um, increased uh, white cells, leukocytosis, uh, elevated numbers of eosinophil, so eosinophilia, and they actually can transiently get pulmonary infiltrate, so areas of infiltrate in the lungs. Now, in some situations, the patients may present with uh, cutaneous or skin manifestations, uh, reporting that they have painless um, swellings that tend to migrate on the skin. 
Now, as far as chronic disease, it's the mature lung flukes that are going to trigger this late stage um, infection. Uh, this is where we're going to see our cough, our recurrent um, hemoptysis, our coughing up of blood. Uh, patients may also have chest pain, trouble breathing, fevers, chills. Now, depending upon the severity of infection and also the potential um, secondary bacterial infections, patients may end up with pneumothorax, so air around the lung. They may end up with pleural effusions. They may even develop pleural adhesions. Um, but not just the lungs. You also can get extra pulmonary disease where the immature flukes may migrate to a number of tissues, including the brain, which can be devastating. In that case, cerebral paragonomyosis, though rare, um, might happen about 1% of the time with a species that we see, um, Paragonimus western mani. And in that case, you can have um, a much higher mortality rate than with the pulmonary disease. Now, what about serological testing? Um, serological tests are important in early disease, right? We still have migration, and this is before egg production. This could be a really large window. This could be 8 to 12 weeks. So serological tests are important, and think about the stage of disease when we're looking at diagnosis here. Once we get late-stage disease, then we can actually start to look for the eggs. But thinking about this is going to be in the lungs, so we're actually going to be looking at sputum. Um, so late-stage late disease can be diagnosed by microscopic evaluation of eggs in sputum. So an OMP on sputum, bronchoalveolar lodge fluid, and more rarely in the stool, sometimes coughed up and passed through. Um, you want to be careful, actually, and alert the lab for what you're looking for. Because as you see in this gentleman, we're seeing uh, a man for a long time coughing up blood. One might think of tuberculosis. And if you go ahead and prepare a tuberculosis smear, you might actually destroy the eggs and not see them. So it's important to think about it and work with your um, lab when you're looking for this diagnosis. As far as imaging, a lot of modalities can help us. Ultrasound, um, x-ray examinations, CAT scan, MRI. Um, there's even um, a PET scan technology that can help us make this diagnosis. Uh, here's a wonderful image um, of eggs, which can be in stool, but again, sputum is probably the main place to be looking for these. What about treatment? We're back to praziquantel. Um, we can also use triclobendazole here. It's effective as well. Um, and actually, when they've compared praziquantel and triclobendazole, um, both options have similar efficacy. The triclobendazole is a one-time. Uh, the praziquantel, you actually have to do three times a day for three days to have the same efficacy. What about our patient? Now, our patient had sputum sent for ovarian parasites. And these operculated eggs were seen that were identified in the lab as Paragonimus westermanii eggs. Patient was treated with praziquantel, 25 milligrams per kilogram, three times a day for three days. He did well, and he had resolution of that coughing up of blood. Preventing and controlling paragonomyosis. Uh, it's become almost a platitude in the field of parasitic diseases that if you control feces and urine, you can combat about 80% of the non-vector-borne infections this way. Uh, that same is true for paragonimus. The biggest um, habit to avoid is to avoid eating raw or undercooked freshwater crustaceans. And there are places in the world where crustaceans are eaten on a regular basis and they're eaten almost alive. Uh, so try to change that habit and... Um, so far, we have not been able to do that by education or showing you that, you know, this is really going to result in a very serious infection if you continue to eat this way. Uh, people grow up with their habits, and uh, those mostly cuisine habits are very, very difficult to uh, affect change on. If you want to know more about paragonomyces, in this case in Japan, uh, here's a nice 20-year retrospective case study uh, and review of the way these patients present. And uh, we've had an episode, of course, on paragonomyosis on TWIP. You can find TWIP at microbe.tv slash TWIP. The next time we meet, um, we'll be uh, into our last session for parasitic diseases and its trematodes of minor medical importance. Thanks for listening. 